As a child, I didn't get in trouble a lot. But I, when I did, I knew exactly when I was in trouble. Two things would happen. One, my parents would call me by my full name, middle name included. And the other was they would ask me to have a seat in the chair next to the TV. This was not voluntary. And this is the closest I ever want to be to being on trial. The chair was perfectly positioned next to the TV so that while my mother lectured me and my father nodded beside her, he could keep watching Sports Center. <laughs> it was also a little bit too big for me, so my feet didn't touch the ground. So usually what I would do is I would curl my entire body up as if I could hide from whatever punishment was coming. Usually punishment for me meant getting a lecture and then having to pick up sticks in the backyard, which is a big deal to a 10-year-old. If I really messed up, my mother would end every lecture by asking me this question. Who do you have to spend the rest of your life with? When you're a 10-year-old trying to get out of trouble with your mother, you think the appropriate answer is, your mother. It's not. <laughs> the, only person, the only person that you have to spend your entire life with is yourself. Over the first month of school, you've heard from new faculty who have woven their life experiences into a narrative to hopefully share something about themselves while giving you a message to think about. My speech is going to be no different. For those of you who I've not met, I am Ms. Bihar. Today on this chilly fall morning, I'm going to talk about living with yourself. It seems like a devastatingly simple concept, and you may think that this speech is going to be over soon so you can finish whatever homework you didn't get to over the weekend. Sorry, freshmen, if you haven't finished your reading, you're not gonna get it done in this period. Living with yourself means being comfortable with yourself, understanding your mind, your body, and your spirit. Being able to stand up for your opinions and beliefs, even if everyone else around you disagrees, and allowing others to disagree with you and not let your world crumble around you. Living with yourself means being, con means being content with your decisions and your actions. This doesn't mean settling for the easy way, but choosing the path that's right for you. When I was in boarding school, it I soon came to the realization that I was not the smartest girl in class. Now, I wasn't the dumbest, but when you're competing with students that are taking advanced calculus classes at the nearby college, and you don't understand geometry, you kind of see a difference. Knowing I wasn't the smartest anymore, I could have decided to settle. Work hard enough to get good grades, but not put myself through any undue stress. I could have blamed the people that were smarter than me. It was their fault I wasn't going to get into a college, good college. It was their fault I wasn't going to get any recognition. And I did for a while. But then I realized that blaming them didn't change anything. So I started to look outside academics. I got involved in sports. I wasn't very good there either. Any of the soccer girls that have seen me attempt to juggle a soccer ball can attest to this. So I got involved in student government. And I lost a couple of elections too. Suddenly my mother's words came back to me. I only needed to live with myself. I could never control other people's actions, but I could always control my own. So I stopped worrying about other people's grades and focused on my own. And mine got better. I still didn't have the highest GPA, but I realized that I didn't need that affirmation. I focused on improving my soccer skills, and I started receiving statewide attention. I also started leading the team in yellow cards, but that's a story for another day. I actually won a student government election. And best of all, I was doing all these things my way. At the end of the day, I wasn't pulling all nighter studying for AP Physics because I didn't take it. I didn't enjoy physics. Sorry, Mr. Ander. So instead, I took psychology. I was able to present myself on college applications as a well-rounded high school student who would be a successful college student as well. Now, right now, you're probably thinking, Ms. Vihar, the power of positive thinking can only get you so far. And you're right. I was deferred and denied admission to my dream college. I remember sitting in class being in complete and total shock. They didn't want me. I had done everything right. I worked hard in school, 
I wrote my essays, I went to visit the school, I did well on my ACT and my SAT, but I wasn't enough for them. And with the wisdom that comes from time and distance, I came to realize that school wasn't right for me. I couldn't have been myself there. While I was able to completely engage with who I was and who I wanted to be at UNC Chapel Hill. Living with yourself also means cutting yourself some slack. Knowing that you can only do so much. I tell my advisees this every Friday because it seems like every Friday someone is freaking out about a grade or a teacher or something they, that didn't go according to plan. And that's the beauty of life. Things aren't going to go according to your plan. The first day I actually started student teaching, I was ready. I had my PowerPoint. I had my worksheets. I had my lunch pack. I had my outfit picked out. I was ready to go. And it was a failure. I utterly and completely bombed my first lesson. I sat down with the teacher I worked with, and before he could even open his mouth, I started sobbing in the classroom right there. He couldn't get a word in, but he turned his computer monitor to face me. And on his computer monitor was an Excel spreadsheet listing my weaknesses, which was an extremely long list, but also listing my strengths. And he said, these are things you can work on. You cannot do everything in one day. And so we started working on my weaknesses. And that list got smaller and smaller. It still hasn't gone away, but the strengths are more now. But there are some things that no amount of schooling can teach you how to deal with, such as the time that I opened up the blinds in my classroom and watched a student get into his car to drive off campus. Then I relied purely on instinct and took off sprinting outside of a classroom in this dress and a pair of cowboy boots jumped in front of his car, found out that he had done everything by the book, and turned to walk back to the classroom. <laughs> On my walk back, I was thinking, how am I going to redeem myself for this <laughs> incredibly embarrassing situation? And you know, I just said I got to live with it. And I walked into the classroom, and all my students said was, Ms. Bihar, you had a pretty good pace. We were pretty impressed. <laughs> and we pressed on. <laughs> Living with yourself is also about not taking yourself too seriously. When I was in graduate school, I rode a bike to class every day. I loved my bike. It was an old road bike with thin white wall tires and a basket on the back for my backpack. Oh, I was so cool. Um, but I don't think the bike loved me back because one day I fell off. I overcorrected when I was, went off the sidewalk and I fell. And this just wasn't one fall. This was a series of falls. I went over the handlebars, went head first into a bike rack, my backpack slid over my head, and the bike landed on top of me. <laughs> so I'm laying on the ground in the middle of Wake Forest campus with a bike on top of me. <laughs> bike falls happen to six-year-olds, not grad students. And all I could think is, how am I going to explain this to anyone? And I picked it up, picked up my bike, and got my helmet back on straight, because I wore a helmet because I was safe, <laughs> and walked my bike to class. As I was walking, I made a decision. This was not something I was going to be able to hide. My scraped knees, my legs, and my arms would not allow it. Instead, I would embrace it. I fell off my bike. I'm clumsy. It's life. I can't do anything about it. I walked into my professor's office, terrified she'd be angry that I missed class. Instead, she was disgusted, probably not because of my lack of balance, but maybe the fact that I was missing about a third of the skin on my left leg. So, yeah, it was pretty gross. Um, <laughs> so she, went, she sent me to student health. And I became the first Wake Forest grad student that had injured herself by falling off a bike and required a doctor's supervision because my scrapes were so bad. 
Now, I'm wearing tights today, so you can't see it, but I have a giant scar on my left knee from my, <laughs> from my bike incident. And whenever anyone asks about it, as they do frequently, I could lie. I could say that I was Jennifer Lawrence's stump double for the Hunger Games, <laughs> and I fell in the arena. I could say I was at the Democratic National Convention and saved President Obama from an assassination attempt. <laughs> but instead, I tell the truth, and I laugh, and people laugh along with me. Now, I could stand up here and tell you that I have living with myself totally down. But that would also be a lie. But living with myself is accepting that I cannot fully understand myself because I have a long way to go. And that's what I want to leave you with here today. It's okay. It's not okay to stop trying, but it's okay to try and fail. Ms. Hunt talked about the importance of failure, and that is the wonderful thing about Lalamere. Here, failing is like falling off the balance beam at gymnastics practice. You fall into a foam pit. It's terrifying, but it's kind of fun. It is, if you haven't done it before. Um, you get the wind knocked out of you. You roll out. You hop right back on the balance beam. Failing is the only way you can get better at something, because that means you're working outside your comfort zone. I've messed up about as many crossword puzzles as the New York Times can publish. But I keep playing, partially because I'm a huge nerd and I love them but partially because I want to be good at them. And I keep failing, and I keep trying. And it's okay. You are all here in a beautiful, supportive environment. Many of you have come from other schools and had other experience that, experiences that showed you what can happen if students are not supported. I frequently say the best decision I ever made was going to a boarding school. Now on my top 10 list is coming to teach here at La Lemire. People told me I was crazy. Moving to Indiana was ridiculous when there were plenty of good jobs in North Carolina. North Carolina needed good teachers and I was letting all those kids down by leaving for parts unknown. I was a fool for moving to a place where I didn't know a single person. The winters were cold, they'd make fun of my accent. I heard about every excuse in the book and most of them are right. <laughs> but if I had stayed in North Carolina, I would have settled. Staying home and teaching where I already knew what I already knew and be in my comfort zone. So I knew deep down this was the right place for me. A place where I didn't just see my students in the dorm, I mean in the classroom, but on the sports field, in the dorms, and truly being themselves. A place that would not only let me teach, but would also let me learn. Where it's okay that we need to Google a fact in world history class because I don't know it. Because I'm still learning, and so are you. Every single one of us in here, faculty and staff included, are learning. We're learning about each other, and the world around us, and most importantly, about ourselves. The Lalamere motto is character, scholarship, and faith. This isn't just for students. It's for all of us. I want you to always remember the only person you will live with for the rest of your life is yourself. So make that someone you want to be around. Thank you.